Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor David Wagner, and uh, you are here with us at our Savior Comus. Good to have uh, a church quite crowded with people. We've got chairs, hopefully, for everyone. It is good to be alive in God's clean, beautiful world, and uh, as we make it a practice to see something beautiful every new day of our lives, I think we're going to keep seeing uh, that we are a part of, and this world, in spite of all of its struggles, um, we're going to be a part of the difference, making it a better place to live. So let's keep that in mind as we worship together. There are some announcements this morning I'd like to call to your attention. Hopefully everyone has a bulletin or maybe to share one with somebody else. Uh, every Wednesday during the Lent season, uh, I'm going to be sending out, if you have given us your email, uh, an invitation to a midweek, about 45 minute devotional for Lent. And uh, as you get the invite in your email, you just click that link and you will appear um, on my Zoom screen. And uh, we will do the Bible study together. Remember, that's at 12 noon on Wednesdays, all the way through till the 24th of this month. We want to uh, call your attention also to a flower chart. We've decided to see if we can't, uh, not during Lent, because this is purposely empty during Lent, because we do not spe put special flowers up during the Lent season. But if you have a, a day, a special Sunday or a day during the week that you'd like to place flowers in honor or in celebration or in memory of someone very important in your life, uh, take a moment and just sign up on the date that you would prefer to have those flowers placed. And then in the little envelope down below is uh, an envelope you can take out and uh, you can put your name on it and the contribution for, for the flowers. The Easter lilies are different. We're also doing, doing um, Easter Memorial Garden around the altar here for the 4th of May, uh, 4th of April, and we hope that you'll contribute for those uh, wonderful smells, because they certainly do make a place uh, smell like it's Easter, in, in my estimation. Uh, want to turn it over to our congregational president for what to me is a happy announcement. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. What a wonderful sight this morning. Look out there, we've actually got a full house. <laughs> Realize that we're still making every attempt to social distance. We're doing everything possible to help uh, prevent the spread of COVID as we have come back to live in-person worships. But I have a special announcement to make this morning. Uh, by now, you've all probably received, uh, for voting members of the congregation, a notice of a special meeting of the Congregation of Our Savior Lutheran Church. This meeting will be held following the 10 a.m. worship service in the sanctuary on Sunday, March 21st, for the purpose of extending a regular call for part-time pastoral services for the Reverend David Wagner to continue to be our pastor. Please plan to attend if you are able. Your vote is very important to us. Any questions you may have, please see me after church or give me a call or send me an email. All my information is in the bulletin. Uh, one more announcement that I'd like to make. I know some of you have had a little bit of an issue signing on to Zoom. Uh, you aren't too certain about the latest and greatest in technology. If you do have a problem, please call me. I can set up a, uh, a fake Zoom meeting and walk you through how to sign on so that you can join us weekly for our uh, devotionals on Wednesday. Thank you very much. We are favored this morning uh, to have something that uh, here at Our Savior we've really come to enjoy, and that's uh, our own Ferrante and Teicher. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure you know Ferrante and Teicher, but I sure do. And they have two pianos. We just have one. But we do have four hands that work together to make a beautiful sound. So let's make that our meditation as we prepare to worship.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace have you been saved by faith. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, so that Christ may live in your hearts and lives. Amen. In the cross of Christ I glory, an old but beautiful hymn, we are asking our hymn leader to sing for us the first and fourth verses. We will uh, observe the no singing rule on this song and enjoy Betsy singing uh, for us this familiar hymn. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray, holy God. Through your Son, you've called us to live faithfully and to act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for today is a reading from Exodus. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, you brought you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol 
whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be God. God. second reading for today is from 1 Corinthians. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life.
Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their temples, tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remember that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, Lord. O Christ. Let's bow together in prayer. Good and gracious God for this uh, beautiful day where we are alive and even with the challenges of every new day, we're th so thankful that your Holy Spirit has promised to journey with us in every step of our way. Help us to be mindful of that presence in our cars as we drive, in our homes where we sit, and when we speak with our loved ones, either by phone or by Zoom, help us to realize that you wish to show to us your great love for us that will sustain us and bring us comfort through the Lent season, but far more than that, through all the days of our lives. And when it does come, that we shall stand before you, Lord, on the beauty of Easter Sunday. Help us to hear that ancient message, Christ is risen, and to accept that that is good news for all people, for all people of the world. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Once upon a time, the good Lord called me to start a Lutheran mission congregation. The location was East Grand Forks, Minnesota. The National Church had set up my family and me in a nice home located directly in the area where I was to start this new church. Some 20 years earlier, a kindly lady left in her will a piece of land to the church and designated that someday it would become a new Lutheran church and so I started my work there. The home where I lived was also the office, the location of Bible studies, the bulletins were prepared there out of that home and council meetings were all held there. The location of the office in the home was just off the family room. So as I was uh, in my office working and doing what I thought was very important, my two little kids spent a good deal of time in the family room listening to their favorite of all television shows, Sesame Street. Remember it? Yeah. There was, of course, Big Bird, Cookie Monster, and The Grouch, the one we all laughed at because he lived in a garbage can. Once when sitting in my office, just off the family room, and even though the door was shut, I could hear the opening song for Sesame Street. And I could hear from up above, Mark and Gretchen came running. It was their favorite show, and they turned the volume up. 
Yes, I was busy with my sermon for the next Sunday in the gymnasium at a local elementary school where we would gather each Sunday, but I couldn't help but hear a new tune that day blaring from my television. And the narrator told me this familiar, but not familiar song. It was new, but it was Sesame Street, so I thought there was some lesson it was trying to teach. And the narrator said, a goat can feel happy, a goat can feel sad, a goat can feel wonderful, a, vo a goat can feel mad. Feel mad, feel mad. It ain't bad to feel mad. If someone pulled the hair on his chin, would a goat say nothing, stand there and grin? No, I get mad, I get mad. It ain't bad to get mad. And what if someone gave him a fright? Would a goat laugh, ha ha, it's quite all right. No, says the goat, I get mad. I get mad, it ain't bad to get mad. And if a friend lets me him down, uh, the pig with the ice cream cone snorting, forgot to bring one for you, would a goat say, no matter, don't worry, I couldn't care less. No, says the goat, I get mad. I get mad, it ain't bad to get mad. And in the end, most folks are glad to find out what makes him mad. He gets mad, but it ain't bad to get mad. Sesame Street, the 1980s, and I asked my kids that day, what, what did you hear? And they were busy listening to the next part of Sesame Street and we really didn't have much time to talk, but it's always stuck in my head. Is it okay to get mad? Usually not. We turn into unreasonable and loud, irrational beings when we get mad. Usually not. We forget about the others around us. Their feelings, their opinions are all forgotten because we got mad. Whatever triggered the anger may not have anything to do with the outrage that I'm portraying, perpetuating, but something stuck in my craw and I got mad. We close ourselves off to the other person's ideas and we become convinced that our way is the best way when we let ourselves get mad. We hold in anger for years and it comes out, it makes us cynical, uh, sarcastic, closed down, often rather negative about everything because we're holding something inside called anger. We've all heard the latest about anger management courses and how many people should be taking them. Who out there is really angry about something this morning? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Who's angry about something? Could you bring anger into church? Would it be okay to be angry here? To raise your voice, to scold? Well, I can recall the childhood memory of hearing about my Jesus, sweet shepherd of the sheep, kindly and sweet master of my soul, losing it. Where? Out on a hilltop somewhere in the wilderness? No, it was in the temple. Jesus got mad. A whip of cords. I'm not sure what it would look like, but if you had a rope and then you put some knots in it and then tied it together, it would become a pretty effective weapon. He overturned the tables. I could just hear my mind that clanging sound as the tables upended and the coins went rolling around. And he chased out the animals and the birds. And he said, stop making my father's house a marketplace. Anything in his way was subject to his attack. He shows a violence that rarely helps the situation. I recall actually becoming afraid 
of Jesus when first I heard this lesson about the temple cleaning. Not my Lord, not just another angry man in a world already so filled with anger. I can remember being afraid when my father would get angry. He was angry at me sometimes, angry at the neighbor, angry at other people. And my father, like a lot of men in that day and age, really knew how to swear. <laughs> Thank God Jesus <laughs> didn't. I remember when the neighbors would go get all hit up about something. Sometimes they were mad at nature because the rains didn't fall. Sometimes they were mad at the government. But I heard a lot of anger, and whenever I heard anger, it always kind of frightened me inside. I don't know about you, but it seems like I live in a world, and I think you do too, where there are a lot of angry people. Here's a way that you might test it. When you're at a stoplight, and there's a bunch of cars behind you, and you're stopped, you're the first in line. When the light turns green, just hold off. <laughs> and in Sarasota, there are a lot of angry people. <laughs> And the first thing they do, it must be great fun, huh? The palm of the right hand of the right hand. Ah! Because you, you did a very, very bad thing. You didn't step on the gas as soon as that light turned green. Where does all that anger come from? I, I, I think it's, it's a part of human nature. We get angry because things don't happen when we want them to happen. We get angry because our family doesn't ever quite live up to our expectations. We get angry at ourselves, probably most sadly. And we condemn or berate ourselves for not having done something different than we did. Anger, we sit, we stew, and the psychiatrists, psychologists, haven't they had a heyday with this? Trying to talk to you and to me about why are we so angry? Why do we hold this anger inside and why do we seem to let it come out at times? We don't, we don't even expect that we were angry about that. But yet something flies out of our mouths and we realize, I must have been angrier than I thought. Well, we talk uh, in today's world about angry people and one of the things that's become a term is the name Karen. Uh, a Karen who is usually a very nice name for a very nice person probably, is a woman who finds herself scolding and screaming and yelling about something with no apostle reason. Maybe it's because she had, feels she has the right to not wear a mask when everyone else is wearing a mask, or she's wearing a mask and somebody else doesn't have their mask on, and so she blows her top. Well, there are men and women Karens in our world. We know that we've seen them. Sometimes we have been them. But that attitude, that spirit of what we do and how we deal with our anger has gotten so bad in our country that I think it's a big part of why the riot on the Capitol building, it's anger that's penned up inside of probably very fine people who just have had it and they believe their anger is more righteous than somebody else's anger. Anger. And we today meet our sweet little Jesus boy. We didn't know who he was, born in a manger. We didn't know that he came to save us. And then, and then little by little, we realized he was our friend. The Ten Commandments aren't clear about many things, but one of the things that it's certainly not clear about is whether you have the right to get anger, angry or not. And I'm sitting here with the unsettling task of coming to know this Jesus a little better today through his anger. Jesus is not about business as usual. 
Jesus is not the protector of the status quo. Jesus has no interest in propping up institutions of faith that elevate comfort and complacency over holiness and justice. Jesus is a disruptor. He's a leveler, an upender of tables. As his disciples immediately realize when he throws out the money chaser, changes and he cleans the temple, zeal, zeal. It means really excited or angry or troubled about something. That their Messiah, our Messiah, certainly is greatly uncomfortable with certain things that he saw in the temple of the day. This angry Jesus, the one that we come to when we feel most beat up, the one who is a shepherd, who doesn't take his shepherd's stock and, and whip the sheep with it, no. This Jesus we must come to know is someone who does have something to tell us though about our faith and how comfortable we might be in a faith that doesn't grow or doesn't challenge status quo, that lets people get by with things that they shouldn't, that allows our own faith to become complacent, to hold inside the things that we ought to let go of and to make it acceptable to live where there is gross injustice or where people are being treated badly. We've come to be accepting of that and Jesus wants to talk to us about the righteous anger we ought to be feeling. Where does this leave us as Christians and churchgoers? What can we carry away from this disturbing story as we move deeper into Lent, a season of repentance and self-examination? Because Jesus interrupts our business as usual, as he did that morning in the temple. He says, I will not let my father's house become a marketplace. How would we rephrase that for what he might be angry with us about? What might he find so troubling about us that he wants to have a parental word with us? What does he find in me and in you that, that needs to be rooted out? If ever there was a time for Jesus to have his talk with us, it seems like Lent would be a good time to do that. I think he wouldn't yell or scream at our mistakes, even though that day, the temple situation and how it had become a marketplace was so troubling to him that he did demonstrate his anger. But that's a different time and a different situation. I want to talk about the Jesus who I turn to in my, in my lack and my problems, who I need in my faith. And I want to recognize that like a loving parent, he may have to have a comeuppance with me. He may need to take me to the woodshed, as the old folks used to say about correcting their children. And I do not believe my, my children rarely, if ever, got a swat of a capital punishment. But even though they did, their children, my grandchildren, have never had a once had a swat. <laughs> That's the world we live in. We don't use capital punishment anymore to correct children. And some of you may say that's a problem with America. <laughs> but at any rate, we've learned so much about our anger when it's directed wrong by a parent to a child, can hurt that child forever. But what if it was Jesus who wanted to talk to us? And he caught us, he got us, he reached to us, and he got honest with us. And he said to, you, to each of us, I love you so much, my son, my daughter, but I've got to talk to you about something that is beneath you, that doesn't sit well in your growth into the person I want you to be. What if Jesus sat with us and we could see, we could hear that, that he wants to change some aspect of us? 
Is that possible? Is there, Jesus got a work to do beyond just patting us on the head and saying, well done. Maybe he does. Maybe he's got something else he needs to talk about besides just affirmation, loving us and encouraging us in our journey. If he does, then I for one am ready to listen. I'm, I'm aware that my own fear about the angry people in the world could easily carry over into that conversation, but that isn't how Jesus wants to speak. He doesn't want to yell at me or scream at me or upturn the tables in my life. What he wants to do is he wants to show me that he loves me so much. He wants me to see how much more I can be, how much better I can be, how much more innovative and creative and, and full of curiosity he wants me to be, how much more he wants me to see the future instead of just seeing the down spirit of the present, how much he wants to take me to places I've yet to understand, how much, how much does this coin scattering Jesus who tripped and stumbled and fell and everything went scattering this angry Jesus. What does he want to do for me? Is there a place for him to speak with me, to talk to you, something to say to you, and he's not ever, ever going to frighten you with it? Because like a really good parent, he knows you can't take a lesson taught through a angry voice. We'll only get defensive, won't we? We'll only say, oh, no, 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 I didn't do anything. <laughs> it's not my fault. Jesus says, no, I love you, my son, my daughter. But I love you so, so much. I have to talk about a few things with you. Maybe those voices of encouraging us to rethink our journey. Maybe those voices come from people that we don't really want to listen to either. Maybe they've got the in some insights for us. Maybe our friends, maybe our not so many friends would have a word for us. Let's listen. Let's listen to the Jesus who might have something so important to tell us. That we're picturing him in that temple doing things in my own little heart of hearts, I wish he hadn't done, but he did, and I can't erase it. It's in the Bible, it's true, it's good. Let's see what he might want to say to each of us as he holds us, comforts us, but then says, come on, come on, let's go someplace. I want to show you something. Never be content with who you are in your walk of faith because there's so much more. Amen. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my ransomed soul shall find rest beyond the river.
Let's join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promise of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all who are in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of your church, that your people place their trust in nothing besides you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Especially do we pray for the presiding bishop of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, as he makes his way to the birthplace of our three world religions, there to pray with Muslims and Jewish people about peace in this world. Hear us, O God. The heavens declare your glory, renew your creation, provide leaders in the struggle for a clean air and water, protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems, give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes in the earth and skies. Hear us, O God. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill leaders with the foolishness of your peace and mercy. Your law defends the vulnerable. Work through legislators, judicial systems, and systems of law enforcement to protect the well-being and freedom of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering, especially Beverly Arnold, Judy Berger, Mercer and Bobby Brown, Tanji Gary, Ann Glover, Irene Havens, Patty Coltrider, Denny Ludwig, June McCarthy, their son Tom and Christine McCarthy, Barbara Perry, Doreen Sifak, Inez and Ron Stralo, Mike Richardson, Joan Van Zyl, and Christine Viscoville. Defend victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. You call us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comforts. Clear out anything in our common life that would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O God. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for perpetual and felicity. And all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. 
Bless us with your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior Jesus Christ, you call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs and angels, with the church on earth, and, the, and all the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, for the Son in the eyes. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in that blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. See that the Lord is good. This time I ask you to take the small chalice in your hand and turn the side up that has the small piece of bread inside it. And if you just open a small part of the tab, pull it back just a little bit so that the piece of bread can come into you. And as you do, know that this is the body of Christ given for you. over so that the wine is on the top. Pull the tab back ever so slightly and uh, take and realize that and know it for certain that the blood of Christ has been given to you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer a song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our closing hymn is one well known to our congregation, so if you would please join in on singing the refrain each time it comes up. We're going to have Betsy sing the verses. Uh, but we will all sing the refrain with our masks on, of course. So we begin by singing the frame, refrain together. <laughs>
in peace, Christ is with you. Together we shall listen to our postlude, Come Thou Almighty King, and we'll ask you please to vacate uh, the building using the back folks in the back part of the sanctuary to leave first, and then uh, we'll listen to this beautiful song as uh, we close our hearts now uh, to this gathering and we open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to see what the Lord is calling us to do out there in the, in the real world. <laughs> 